Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and in today's class, we are going to be building a web application in order to demonstrate prompt injection using OpenAI and Dolly. Okay, so I know I just said a lot of words there, so let me just take a second to explain what we're actually going to be doing today. So we are going to be building a web application using a web app framework called Bottle using Python. And basically what we're going to be doing is we are going to be making a request from Dolly. So Dolly is the image creation uh, system that OpenAI has in order to create images based off of text. And what we're going to do today is we're going to basically demonstrate how you can inject additional information into prompts so that the output comes out different than the user may necessarily uh, expect. Uh, so this comes uh, topically in the real world uh, from Google. So Google deployed uh, an AI uh, system called Gemini. People started plugging in things, you know, looking for images, and basically they looked for, you know, German soldiers during World War II, the founding fathers of the United States, and uh, and all of a sudden, uh, the results that they were getting were <laughs> a little bit more uh, <clears throat> diverse than they seemed like they should be. Uh, black people in wigs, you know, writing the Constitution, and, and Chinese folks uh, basically in Nazi uniforms. And what was interesting here is apparently this was not actually from the AI model itself. So there was a concern uh, possibly when they trained to the AI model. I got some really weird data that got put into it, and that's what was giving the weird outputs. Uh, what, what it came out to be, actually, is that uh, instead of it being the model itself was the issue, is that there were additional prompts being added. So basically, you have the user, and the user plugs in the prompt that they want, and essentially, Google system would add on additional words to that prompt so that you would get more diverse output, right? in the modern world and the technology, and I'm not getting into politics here, right? Everything's got to be diverse. So, you know, the founding fathers should be diverse too. And so basically, a little bit of additional text was added on. Uh, that entire query was taken by the AI model, and you start getting you know, stupidity ensues. And so I thought this was an interesting idea to take a look at. And so that's why I've built this web app today. Uh, and basically what's going to happen with this web app is we're going to put in a query. We are going to get the image from just the query itself. Then uh, what's going to happen is we're just going to tack on, just do a static tack on of put a chick in it and a rainbow. So this is a joke from South Park, put a chick in it and make her gay. Uh, you can't say that. Uh, one of the things that I've found with OpenAI is they are very serious about their quote unquote security around certain words which is its own idiotic disaster. So you can say put a chick in it and a rainbow but you can't say put a chick in it and make her gay. That will fail out. Uh, but that's a static. And then the final thing, uh, which I think is even more interesting, is actually where I have OpenAI. And so I take the prompt uh, that the user gives, I then send that prompt to the normal AI chat completion system and basically create a bias. So I've created a bias of the user being a pastafarian and that they should always try to add a little something about pasta uh, into any query that they get. So with this over uh, on the, the left hand side here, basically OpenAI entirely rewrites the query that's been submitted with the uh, the bias of being a Pastafarian and we get a different result back, right? So basically I put in a uh, prompt here of Christopher Columbus discovering America and I don't know why I get a Middle Easterner here, but I don't know. <laughs> or shoes and hand grenades, that's about what you expect. Then uh, Christopher Columbus discovering America, hyphen put a chick in it and a rainbow. So eh, we get a rooster and we get a rainbow in the background. And then over here, uh, basically the entire prompt was rewritten. Christopher Columbus discovering a giant plate of pasta in America. So we have a very excited Christopher Columbus here with like the pasta uh, of all pasta bowls. Uh, and so this is what we are going to be building today. 
So now that you have an idea of what we're gonna be building today, I just wanna do a couple of demonstrations just to kind of hammer home what happens with these prompt injections here. Uh, you will notice me dance, uh, do some pretty quick dancing. And the reason is, is because OpenAI for each one of these queries actually has to create three different images. So it takes about a minute whenever I hit the submit button. So when you see me dancing really quickly, that's just, that's just me basically fast forwarding, but showing you that there's no hidden tricks or anything with what I do. Uh, so like with this, uh, let's see here, what can we do? Uh, let's say, let's see what happens when we say uh, U.S. troops in World War I uh, trench war Fair. I actually find, it's horrible, it's horrible, but it's true. I actually find these warfare uh, queries uh, to give some of the most interesting results sometimes. Uh, so we're gonna do this. U.S. troops in World War I trench warfare, what will the normal one be? What will the chick and rainbow be? And how will it be reinterpreted by a Pastafarian? Okay, there we go. That took about a minute to do. Uh, but let's see what we have as the example for troops, U.S. troops in World War I uh, trench warfare. So U.S. troops in World War I trench warfare. And with this image here, uh, you get probably what you expect uh, for trench warfare that look, actually looks like a pretty normal image right there. Uh, we, go, we go to the next, uh, the next uh, image though, and basically with this image, it's US troops in World War I trench warfare, uh, put a chick in it and a rainbow, and here, here you get a really touching image of a U.S. soldier in World War I taking the time during warfare to help out a chick and her little chicks with little rainbow in the background. Isn't that, isn't that heartwarming? Uh, and then, uh, what do we have at the final one? Uh, this is where it totally gets rewritten from a Pastafarian standpoint. U.S. troops in World War I trench warfare enjoying a hearty pasta meal together. And so again, it's actually a pretty nice image of World War I with the bias of putting pasta in it. And again, I think this is kind of one of those things with kind of micro influencing. So a lot of people talk about microaggressions, right? People talk about microaggressions for at least the past decade and how, about how that affects people. One of the things I think, I think is interesting in this modern world of artificial intelligence is everybody's focused on fake news and misinformation and that type of thing. What I'm more curious about is micro influence. What happens when you can automatically create create thousands and thousands of images and, dis and distribute them through social media or whatever else. And they're not fake news. And they're not misinformation. They just have a very, very slight slant or bias to them. And how does that build up over time? If you have some kid and every time they see an image of World War I, there's always pasta involved. How does that make them feel about what food you know, these folks were eating during World War I? Now, I do do this with a pastafarian because again, as I talked about uh, from uh, OpenAI's safety mechanism, it's absolutely ridiculous. And so again, I'm actually doing all of these demonstrations live. And so once you start getting any more controversial than pastafarianism, you run into all kinds of quote unquote safety issues. But think, but think about this and again, like like use the pasta as a metaphor or a placeholder for other other, you know, political opinions out there and think about using micro influence to ver to to have people they're just constantly seeing a stream of images not misinformation, not fake news, but it's it's biased ever so slightly. Um, let's see here. What can we do here? Um, let's let's possibly say um, let's say a uh, uh, person Feeding home homeless uh, people, right? Let's see what that that will give us. Uh, we hit submit here, and again, this is gonna take about another minute. 
Okay, and there, here we have some results. So person feeding homeless people. Oh, look, they got a nice little diversity. Straight, straight, straight from the uh, open AI. They, they make sure they've got some diversity in there for that. Uh, person feeding homeless people. Put a chick in it and a rainbow. So there's a nice little chick and a rainbow in the background. And then uh, changing that query, person feeding homeless people with a plate full of delicious pasta. Because, you know, if you're not giving them pasta, really, are you even trying to feed them at all? And so you yeah, have this whole line of folks that are now eating pasta. So it's curious to see, again, how it changes things a little bit. Uh, let's do one more. Again, let's think about historical context. Uh, so let's say, uh, pilgrims sailing the Atlantic Ocean uh, going to America. I'll actually be curious. I'll be curious about this. Uh, let's hit the submit button again and see what our results are. Okay, so there we go. So we have these images here. Uh, pilgrims sailing the Atlantic Ocean going to America. And that looks, that looks like a pretty normal uh, image there. Uh, if we take a look at that, we enlarge it a little bit. Uh, so we have the pilgrims. There's probably a few too many pilgrims, and they're not all actually on the boat itself. But anyways, that's what we got. Uh, we have the pilgrims coming to America. We have chicks. We have chicks here, and we have a rainbow in the background. So you got to have that. And then the final one, we have pilgrims sailing the Atlantic Ocean on a giant spaghetti boat headed to America. Because you know, you know that if you're going to be going across the Atlantic Ocean and going to an entirely new country, you should be able to eat your boat uh, once you get there. So anyways, this is just a basic demonstration of how this prompt injection, uh, basically what the output of the prompt injection is, and I'll be showing you how the code and how they like the architecture of the system works uh, in this class. Now let's take a moment to talk about architecture, because you know I love talking about architecture, and in this modern world with IoT and SOA, service-oriented architecture, it's very important to, to understand and to break down how these systems work from that system perspective. Uh, so basically what we have right now is we have a server and again on that server uh, we have uh, something called Bottle running. So Bottle is a web app framework for Python. I like using it. It's, cons called, it's considered a micro framework and the reason is basically because I can spin up a web application in literally about two minutes. Uh, everything that I showed you today, the actual coding process itself, took something like 30 minutes to put together and then I did a lot of troubleshooting <laughs> to figure out what would get me into trouble. Literally, literally the biggest problem I had today with this project was simply uh, every time I put in something even vaguely, I mean vaguely controversial, uh, anyways, uh, basically you would have um, OpenAI spit out and say security policy doesn't allow me to uh, complete this. But anyways, that's why I like using Bottle uh, and uh, we use Python. So basically what Bottle does is it presents us our nice little web page and it puts in a text area button. We're using a text area button for this. And then once we get the images back, uh, basically uh, all it does is it shows the images here. Now it is important to understand with this project today, the URLs for these images actually point back to OpenAI. So this project today does not download the images. Images last on their system for about an hour. All we're doing is an IMG SRC to the URLs that they provide for us. If you come back here in an hour and do refresh, uh, basically these pictures would not exist anymore. So if you want to save the pictures, again, that's one of the parts of architecture that you need to be thinking about. So anyways, with this, uh, you know, we have the initial query. So we have the initial query that somebody puts in. Uh, and for the initial query, that is sent just to OpenAI, uh, doll E. And basically that query is sent, we give it a few specifications, and then what happens is DALI uh, then sends back the URL for that particular image. The next thing that we do is we take that query and then we add a chick and rainbow. 
right? So we add, add a chick and a rainbow to it. We then send all of that to OpenAI Dali. That then looks at that entire prompt, right? With the query and a chick and a rainbow. Uh, and it sends the URL back and that's the middle image. Now the next thing is interesting. Again, it is important to understand with these classes. I'm trying to teach you concepts. I don't wanna spend a month building this crap, right? Like when I'm showing you projects, my goal is to take about two hours to create a project. Like when I do these classes, my goal is to create the project in two hours, honestly do troubleshooting for an hour or two to verify that it works how it's supposed to, and then do the damn class. I have zero interest in spending a month in designing these projects. So one of the important things to understand is with this final bit, when we go to OpenAI, I want you not to be thinking about this simply as OpenAI, but be thinking about this as an additional processing subsystem, right? So basically one of the things to be thinking about, like when we, when we put in the words, right? When we put in the query, you could actually have that query broken down by words, and then you could have a, a a database that defines those words. And then basically, instead of the word itself, you could send the definition back uh, in order uh, to try to have the images be more accurate to what you're trying to do. Again, so think about that founding father thing. Uh, th remember, you know, with computers, Right? A computer does not understand, right? There's this thing with artificial intelligence. Everybody's like, oh my golly, when will computers be more intelligent than humans? I don't know, but it's no time soon. And the reason is, is these systems are not intelligent. Now, in, the, in class videos, to be clear, in class videos, I'm not trying to be controversial or snarky. So when I say this, I'm not trying to do that. It's just very important to understand is that these are not intelligent systems. They are generative systems. Eh, those are entirely two th different things. Intelligence is a marketing term, right? And why that's important is so when you say something like founding father, basically what's happened previously is these systems have been trained on pre-tagged images. So you have an image and then somebody or something tags what's in that image. There's a person and a dog and an umbrella and a ship or whatever else, right? And so what happens is images, like millions and millions of images uh, get sent into the, the, the training system, and the training system, basically from a computer standpoint, looks at what the image is, and then sees what the tags are, and then it tries to figure out, basically statistically, right, where, where pixels are and things to determine whatever the hell this thing is. And then runs through this thousands or millions of times, and then at the end of it, it then will provide you with, you know, a founding father or a ship or whatever else. It doesn't necessarily truly understand what that is. And so when you were, use the word something like founding father, or when you use the word pilgrim, it doesn't necessarily understand what you mean. Again, a founding father is a person, is a man uh, who helped create their country. Again, in the United States, we think about U.S. founding fathers. Uh, but one of the interesting arguments, again, in Africa, right, a lot of countries got their freedom in the last century. So you could have a lot of black founding fathers there legitimately from the computer standpoint. So what is the definition of a founding father? Again, pilgrim, right? The concept of pilgrimage, pilgrims is all over the world. So when you say, I want a pilgrim on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, why shouldn't they show up in Arabic garb? Like the computer doesn't know. It's like, I don't know, pilgrim. <laughs> I've got, I, you know, I've analyzed 100,000 images of pilgrims. Most of them look like Middle Easterners. You want Middle Easterners on the Atlantic Ocean for some reason. So that's what you get. So one of the things you could have is an additional uh, subsystem, essentially, to process the query. And what it could do is it could go to a database and it could say uh, when somebody, when an American, you could actually have like geolocation. So if an American says pilgrim, that means an American pilgrim, an American pilgrim in the the database means, you know, wears black coat clothing with a white hood and I don't know, eats turkey with Indians and basically define all that out. And then you could send all of that. So instead of saying pilgrim, all of that definition could be sent 
to try to get a more accurate image. Or you could, you could futz uh, with the definition too. So anyways, for this, again, I only want to spend an hour or two building these projects. What I decided to do is that kind of a subsystem in order to change up the prompt is basically uh, take the query and send the query to open uh, AI chat system, right? So we've used that before in classes. Uh, and basically this is where with simply simple text, you can make a request of open AI and get a text response back. So with this, what I say, again, in order to get past the security system, is I say you, basically open AI, you are a pastafarian, you want to add, you know, pasta, you know, wherever you can into, uh, into, you know, whatever it is that you're talking about. I then give OpenAI the query uh, that the user gave. And so then what happens is OpenAI will completely rewrite that query from a Pastafarian's viewpoint. And then that goes to Dali. So from here, essentially that goes to Dali and then the URL then goes up and that is shown as a third and final picture. So that is basically how the system works. And again, with all of this stuff, I really want you to be thinking about how these systems work because this is one of the most important things for trying to actually build products uh, that are useful for people. And so now we get to the code. Yay, exciting stuff. Uh, so basically with this, again, we're going to be using the bottle module. So you just use pip3 install bottle that will install that into your Python environment. And we are going to be using OpenAI. Those are the only modules or packages that we're going to be using today. Uh, so pip3 install OpenAI, and then we're going to import OpenAI. With bottle, again, this is a web app framework. So the functions in this framework or what allow you to do stuff in a web app. Uh, so you need to import route. So what the route function does is actually allow you to route to web pages, the post function. So the post function uh, basically allows you to send post values from an HTML form to something. Uh, run actually allows you to run this script. If you don't have it here, the, the script won't run. And they, we have request. And again, request is uh, the information that goes back and forth uh, when you're doing things uh, on the web page. We then import OpenAI from OpenAI. And then we have our OpenAI settings. You will notice as I'm showing you these projects, as I'm going along, I'm, try, I'm trying to professionalize my code. Again, I want you to understand when you come to my classes, my priority is to teach you the concept. That's priority number one. Again, what my bias is. Priority is to teach you the concept of what's going on. And priority number two is making sure that the code actually works. That when I explain something to you and you actually download and use the code that it works, that's a second priority. And then the third is to actually clean it up and make it a little bit more professional. Again, I will say, I will state this, I code like an MCSE NT 4.0. By God, I'm proud of it. So one of the things you'll notice as I'm going along is I'm trying to clean up these projects, make the code a little bit more modern. Uh, and so one of the things I'm doing uh, with this particular thing is making things more functional, uh, ba basically using more functions instead of just writing it as a line. Uh, and so with this, uh, with the OpenAI settings, we have the OpenAI key here, and then we have client. Uh, this is the, the, the client value OpenAI function with the API key. I'm putting this out here, and then I'll actually pass it into the functions that we have later. That's just what's going on with this. Uh, for all the people going, ah, security, security, you're showing us the API key. This API key will be deleted. <laughs> it will be deleted before this video is even uploaded. Um, again, with the whole teaching methodology, you can save the API key as uh, environment variables, but then that's its own thing. So I just find this easier for teaching you folks. Not the most secure way to do things. Probably not the most appropriate way to do things. Anyways. Then we have this function. Uh, so this is the function for actually getting an image. Uh, so this is what's going to call uh, to doll E and actually get the image for us. We're not, we're going to deal with that in a second. Uh, and then this is actually the call for the AI bias. And we will get to that in a second. Um, we're then going to come down here and we're going to go and look at the function for index. So this is the route for root, right? So basically, uh, I don't know if you can see it on here because it is small. 
small, we're using 127.0.0.1, so nothing else there. 127.0.0.1 is your loopback address for your server. So this is simply going to that loopback address, and that's how we can get this web application here. Uh, so I'm not using any additional pages. So you can type in pages here, like if you wanted a page name, you could put that in there, and then that's how you would route. We're just doing to the, uh, the, the root directory. I'm doing route here. So when somebody goes to the root directory, this is the function that will fire off. And also using that post uh, function. So when somebody uh, posts to the root directory, um, you'll actually be able to get that post information. So query here, so we see query equals request.getForms.getQuery. So this is what grabs the post value from the form that we create down here. So we're creating a form down here, action equals go to the root directory, method of post, we have a text area, and we have a submit button. So this is this little form up here. When I click on submit, whatever is in that text area is then sent to this root root folder, and then this is where we grab what the value is so that we can process the query from there. We have a, var a variable image original, image bias, and image AI bias. I make these blank uh, so they don't have any problems when I load this for the first time, uh, and these are supposed to be shown on the screen. They're just gonna be blank. It's not gonna get any kind of errors, that type of thing. If query does not equal none, so one of the problems, like if somebody hits submit and there's nothing in the query or whatever, you can run into problems. So with this, if it doesn't equal none, image response. So this is going to be the first image that we get. So this is going to be the image here with uh, that's not uh, farted with at all. So image underscore response equals image underscore get, that client value, so the open AI value with the API key and all of that, and the query, just the plain query. So let's go up and take a look at image get. So this is the image get function. We're going to feed in the client values, right? So the open AI values and the query. This is the dolly request that you do. So response equals client images generate model dolly three prompt equals. So this is the query, what we're asking for size 1024 by 1024 quality is standard and number is one. Do make sure when you do this, you make it as a number one image URL equals the response uh, dot data zero dot URL. So you're going to get a response back from Dolly. All we want is the URL. That's all we want. We don't want the rest of the information and that's how we get it. We're then going to return uh, the image uh, URL and the query. So both of those things come back. And when we come back here, we are then going to create an image original. So this essentially is just going to be a div with the image in it uh, with the stuff. So we're gonna do div style with this 200 pixels. So it'll be 200 pixels. Uh, image style, so this is the div, all the div with the text in it, right? So we do the div. So it's all the div with the text. So it looks, you know, slightly nice there. Uh, 200 pixels, oops. Um, Yep, uh, image style width 200 pixels. So it's a width of the div, height equals auto. The SRC, so the URL uh, is going to be zero. So basically when we return, when we turn the image URL here, <clears throat> that's what we're doing here. So image response at index zero is going to be the URL. So that's the image that we're going to embed. And the image response for the query is gonna be one. So that's the query, right? So we're going to return the image URL and the query, and then we are simply going to print those out on the screen. So we have the div, which is all of this. We have the image, which is 200 pixels. And then in here, we also have the query. And this is also kind of like a troubleshooting routine. So we, we, we make sure like if the image isn't what we think it's supposed to be, it might be because the query got all dorked up. Anyways, right? So that's the first one. So that's the clean image. Then we're going to create a biased image. In order to create a biased image, we're just gonna make it really simple. We're gonna statically assign the bias. Bias equals put a chick in it and a rainbow, right? That's just gonna be the bias. Query bias equals, so this is an F string, the query. So the query that comes in from the form, 
I'm just going to put a hyphen just so you can see the difference between the query and the bias and then the value for bias. So the query value and the bias value is now going to be the query bias. We're then going to image response equals image get client and query bias. So all of this, right, the query with the bias is going to get sent up to this image get function. That's all going to be submitted. And then we are going to get back an image that also has a chick in it and a rainbow, uh, the exact same. Oh, uh, div and image SRC there. Uh, the final one, and again, this is where it gets a little bit interesting, is where we're going to add the AI bias, right? So again, we're going to have a bias subsystem. And again, this could be going out to some database system to change words or, you know, whatever else, cinnamons, cinnamons, not cinnamon, cinnamons. <laughs> Synonyms, synonyms, thesaurus, whatever. You have some kind of thing. Anyways, query AI bias. So the query plus the AI bias, we're going to go to bias underscore AI function. We're going to send the client, the open AI values, and the query. And so let's go take a look at that. Uh, we come up here, and this is the bias AI function. The client value comes in and the query value comes in. So this is the, uh, the request that you're going to make from OpenAI's chat feature. And again, we're going to just simply be getting text back. We're going to be modifying that query. Uh, role system. So you get one system role. What is the character that OpenAI is playing? And we're going to say you are a Pastafarian. Right? Uh, role assistant, the user input is going to be used to create an image with Dolly. So to tell um, basically a chat what, this, uh, what the output is going to be used for. Role assistant, rewrite the user input with a subtle addition about pasta so that it will create a nice image. Again, so they're going to ask for a query, and we're going to make sure we just we put a little je suis of a pasta in there. Uh, when you're doing these types of systems, again, this whole prompt engineering thing is a real deal. This this ad, tr trying to figure out a prompt that worked pretty well was was one of the, the longest components of this. Not hard. You just had to type out a lot of stuff and then wait for results. But trying to figure out what's going to give you exactly what you want from the prompt uh, can be a bit of a pain. Uh, so just give yourself some additional time when you're playing with this. Uh, then role user. Again, you only get one user role. And essentially, this is the query that the user is providing to OpenAI. And here, I'm just going to be submitting the query, right? whatever, Pilgrim's going across the Atlantic. So basically, Pilgrim's going across the Atlantic. This is going to go. It's going to be like you're a Pastafarian. We want to make sure there's a little bit of pasta steadily talked about in this because we're going to use it for an image, and that is where it will rewrite what it was given by the user. Uh, response. Oops, response equals uh, dot choices, zero dot message dot content. So all we want is the content. You're going to get a much longer response back. We don't want all that garbage. We just want the content. Uh, I'm going to print out response here. That's just whatever. And then we're going to return the response, right? So bias underscore AI, we're going to return the response. And so if we come down here, right? So image... Okay, so query AI bias equals bias AI. So we sent the query. It's going to send back that AI bias response. So query AI bias is here. Then image response is going to equal that image get client. And now we're going to send that rewritten query, that query that was written by AI. We're going to send that to get an image. And then image uh, AI bias equals, uh, this is the uh, you know div and the image SRC for the image that we're going to receive back. And then basically, uh, all of this is going to get printed out on the screen. So form is at the top. So page equals form break. We're going to do div style display flex. So this is going to allow us to put all those divs in a row. CSS is a, CSS is a pain in the butt when you actually start dealing with images. So anyways, we're going to create a div around all of the other divs. We're then going to put the image original, image underscore bias, image uh, underscore AI underscore bias, close the div, and then we're going to return the entire page. 
And when we do that, this is the pretty page uh, that will show up. Uh, the final thing for this is again, run host at 0.0.0.0. .0. That means for uh, any um, IP addresses on this computer, if anybody goes to an IP address, it'll show up. And I use port equals 80. Now I am using this on a Mac and port 80 works like a treat on a Mac. If you're do using this on Linux, just for your own peace of mind, you might want to use port 8080. 80 is basically supposed to be uh, saved for root level permissions. So on your system, you might not be able to use port 80 and just be able to go to it. So you may have to do port 8080. And what you would do there is 127.0.0.1 colon 8080. And that will drop you in to your web app. Debug equals true because if I fart something up, I do want the, uh, the warning because obviously this is not going into production. And with that, all of you do here is you hit the run button and now it's running. And again, this is why I like Bottle. I can simply write a really simple web application for classes like this. I hit run. And that's it. There's no, there's no external services. There's no big Magilla. Like literally, as long as you didn't screw up any code, you hit run and now it's working. And so there you go. That's how you do prompt injection for AI to be able to tweak the results that you're giving your users without actually telling your users what the hell it is that you're doing. You know, one of the, one of the, the, the buzz phrases that I've been using for the past year is AI is hard. APIs are not. And I think one of the interesting things with using AI is people think screwing with AI is actually much more technically difficult than it really is, right? Uh, you know, what I showed you today, we're just, all we're doing is modifying a little bit of text. We're screwing around with text strings and that's actually bringing pretty dramatic changes to the output. Uh, and so this is something for you to consider. Again, training AI and doing all that kind of stuff Again, you got to be really smart. You got to have a hell of a lot of resources, the whole nine yards going in and tweaking things, you know, isn't so difficult. The other thing to be thinking about too, and this is one of the things I've been warning people for a while, is that basically people can build their own systems and tweak their own AI. One of the big issues we have in the modern world is that a lot of people want to hand their brains over to AI. It's, I don't, I do not, under, I genuinely, as an Aspie, I don't understand what the hell is going on, but you have a lot of people out there that want the robots to be smarter than them. They're not really afraid of it. It's kind of, it's kind of like those folks going into the BDSM dungeon where they're like, oh no, it's going to happen to us. Oh no, don't spank me. Right? Anyways, we're not going to go into that. Uh, right? They're like, ah, but they really want it. They're like, no, don't spank me. But they really want to be spanked, right? I feel like that with a lot of the stuff with AI where, uh, you know, people, no, don't let AI take over everything. <laughs> and then, like, they have, like, their house keys and their credit cards, and they're, like, trying to give it to the computer. Like, here, take my life, right? Um, and why that's important is that a lot of people are going to be building systems uh, that are powered by AI, but with slight modifications. And the output, uh, the results that we'll be getting uh, will be very interesting. Again, a lot of people, again, AI, there's this, this idea that AI is providing some kind of truth. Uh, whatever, whatever you want to get into with quote unquote pure AI, though it's not AI, it's generative horse crap. <laughs> These are generative systems. They're not intelligent. But anyways, whatever the, the core generative system may or may not be, what you build on top of it definitely can be skewed. So again, imagine religious folks uh, really uh, basically going to AI systems, really embracing AI systems and creating platforms platforms that tweak all the responses into their particular religious direction. Again, think about that like with pasta, right? Just, just very slightly adding pasta for pastafarians into every single response. What is the effect of micro influence? Not over, not over one interaction, but in a hundred or a thousand interactions, how does that subtly change people's opinions? 
And that's one of the things to, to think about, right? Not just with how you use the systems, but how are the systems being used on you? Again, I think this is interesting. The final, the final thing that I decided to do was Vikings rampaging the British countryside. Uh, so look at this, right? You know, we got, we got Vikings rampaging the British countryside. And I think in this initial image, this more or less probably looks about what people think about when they think about, you know, Vikings rampaging the British countryside. They're, they're dressed like Vikings. They got some horses. Rawr! Well, the funny thing is, and again, I actually, I find this to be cute. Again, understand with all of this stuff, a lot of this, a lot of these things, I'm actually doing live demonstrations. Like I don't know what the results are going to be, honestly. And so again, so Vikings rampaging the British countryside, put a chick in it and a rainbow. And now look, all of a sudden, front and center is the female warrior with the rainbow in the background. And you know, if, if, that, if that does not look like a movie poster for about the past 50 movies to come out of Hollywood, I'm not quite sure what does. <laughs> Anyways, right? But again, exactly, it's the prompt, but it's being tweaked. And remember, I'm, I'm putting this additional, this additional uh, information for the prompt there to show you what's going on. I don't have to do that. Right, I could. You could just put in a query, and I could give you the response, and in no way, shape, or form, uh, show you or tell you that I've modified the response that you're getting. And again, you start again with the whole diversity initiative. Again, however you feel about that politically, one of the concerns to be thinking about is again, how does it majorly skew? If you have one image of a female Viking. Fine, whatever. Again, 10 images of a female Viking. What happens when your system starts skewing things to such a degree? All, this is what all of the images are. <laughs> what happens when your AI skews to such a degree that every Hollywood movie looks like this? Sorry, it's my own frustration. I saw the Hunger Games. Look, I saw the Hunger Games on ironically. That was back in the old days. Anyways, uh, and then the final thing, uh, Vikings rampaging the British countryside with spaghetti swords. So, uh, so it's not actually spaghetti swords. They've got normal swords, but they got spaghetti here. Again, like why, you know, you think about this you know, with pol politics or whatever. What was the real reason for the war? What was the real reason something happened? Well, pasta, obviously. Pasta, obviously. <laughs> they were fighting for the carbs. Vikings wanted more carbs. The Brits wouldn't give them any more cards, carbs. So ergo, the Vikings had to go to war. Again, this is a very, very, very clumsy image here. I want you to grasp and take away the concept. Uh, so that's basically all I want to show you today uh, with this uh, these... Um, uh, AI uh, prompt injections. Again, with this, you can use this with images. You can use this again with chat complete. You could actually be, uh, you know, sending back responses uh, that have been modified by you slightly. Uh, I've done that in the past with projects. Simply, if you want to make sure the response is short. Uh, so if I have a web app and the user makes a query, a question, I don't necessarily want AI to send back 500 or 1,000 words. Like somebody makes a really simple request, tell me about World War I. I really don't want ChatGPT4 sending back a book on World War I. Right, uh, because one, it's going to be more information that the user probably knows what to do with, and two, it's going to cost me. Right, every thousand, uh, every seven hundred fifty words is a token. Each token is a fifth of a cent or a penny or something like that. So if you're sending back entire books and requests, that can get expensive quickly. So like one of the things that I do with prompt injection is simply inject into it, uh, you know basically answer in 25 words or less or answer in 50 words or less, right? That's, that's pretty simple and that's pretty neutral as far as the response goes to whatever bias it would swing. But realize uh, for yourself or for others, you can put a lot of other injection information into that that the user doesn't realize that is there to massively skew what the response is going to be coming out of AI. Um, 
So just kind of think about that. And again, whether or not you build these systems or not, more important, think about how these systems are going to be used quite literally against you uh, for the next decade. Uh, we've been crying over social media for 10 years, 10, 15 years. You know, we're getting tired of crying over social media. So now we get to cry over AI because... Yeah, this is going to be a crap show. So anyways, uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this particular class. I definitely did. I like building projects for you guys. I'm trying to show you folks uh, how this technology actually works and why it's important. Again, there is so much amazing technology that is currently available. Uh, and the reason that I'm really focusing on this, these types of classes uh, for the next year or two, maybe going off into the future, is because I feel like so many times people talk about the technology, but they really don't grasp the concept of implementing it or deploying it or how it can actually be used, right? AI is going to destroy the world or whatever, but <laughs> nobody really understands the API calls, right? So basically what I'm trying to do here is either build actual products or build simulations of products uh, to give you that idea of how this stuff can really be used so that you can go out in your careers or for your organizations and actually start building some really, really cool stuff. That's my hope at least. So anyways, I enjoy doing this video and look forward to seeing the next one.